Mud, Sweat and Tears, Chapter 11. I remember vividly as a young teenager finding an old photograph of my father from when he was 17 and a fresh-faced Royal Marines commando. He looked just like me, but much smarter and with a parting in his hair. Next to this photograph in the album was a shot of him ice climbing with his fellow Marines on the north face of Ben Nevis in winter, a treacherous place to be if things go wrong. I asked him about the climb and he told me how a rock forward almost killed him outright that day when a boulder the size of a basketball had been dislodged 200 feet above him. It had missed his head by less than a foot and smashed into a thousand tiny rock fragments just below him on a ledge. He felt he had been handed his get out of jail free card that day, a moment of grace and good fortune. He always told me, never depend on those luck moments. They are gifts but instead always build your own backup plan. I use that thinking a lot in my job nowadays. Thanks, Dad, if you can read this from the other side. As a young boy, I used to love any trips away with him. I look back now and see how much my father also found his own freedom in the adventures we did together, whether it was galloping along a beach in the Isle of Wight with me behind him or climbing on the steep hills and cliffs around the island's coast. It was at times like these I found a real intimacy with him. It was also where I learnt to recognise the tightening sensation deep in the pit in my stomach as being a great thing to follow in life. Some call it fear. I remember the joy of climbing with him in the winter time. It was always an adventure and often turned into much more than a climb. Dad would determine that not only if we did have to climb a sheer 150 foot chalk cliff, but also that German paratroopers held the high ground. We therefore had to climb the cliff silently and unseen and then grenade the German fire position once at the summit. In reality, this meant lobbing clumps of manure towards a deserted bench on the cliff, cliff tops. Brilliant. What a great way to spend a wet and windy winter's day when you are aged eight or 28 for that matter. I loved returning from the cliff climbs totally caked in mud, out of breath, having scared ourselves a little. I learnt to love that feeling of the wind and rain blowing hard on my face. It made me feel like a man when in reality I was a little boy. We also used to talk about Mount Everest as we walked across the fields towards the cliffs. I love to pretend that some of our climbs were on the summit face of Everest itself. We would move together cautiously across the white chalk faces, imagining they were really ice. I had this utter confidence that I could climb Everest if he was beside me. I had no idea what Everest would really involve, but I loved the dream together. These were powerful, magical times, bonding, intimate, fun, and I miss them a lot, even today. How good it would feel to get the chance to do that with him just once more. I think that is why I find it often so emotional, taking my own boys hiking or climbing nowadays. Mountains create powerful bonds between people. It is their great appeal to me. But it wasn't just climbing. Dad and I would often go to the local stables and hire a couple of horses for a tenner, and go jumping the breakwaters along the beach. Every time I fell off in the wet sand and was on the verge of bursting into tears, Dad would applaud me and say that I was slowly becoming a horseman. In other words, you can't become a decent horseman until you fall off and get up again a good number of times. There's life in a nutshell. Chapter 12. On one occasion, we were on Dartmoor, a wild part of the UK in all seasons, and were staying at a small inn, walking and riding each day. It was in the depth of winter with snow on the ground and I can remember how freezing cold it was every day. My young boyish face felt as if it was literally about to freeze solid. I couldn't feel the end of my nose at all, which for someone with a big one like myself, even age 10, was a scary new physical phenomenon. I started to cry. That usually worked to show Dad that things were serious and needed his attention, but he just told me to cover up better and push through it. We were on a proper expedition now. And this is no time to whinge, the discomfort will pass. So I shut up and he was right, and I felt proud to have endured it in my own little way. Moments like that encouraged me to believe that I could persevere, especially, and more importantly, when I felt cold and rotten. Nothing, though, was ever forced on me by him, but a lot was expected if I was to join these adventures. As my own confidence grew, so did the desire to push myself each time a little bit further. We also spent a lot of days messing about together, boating. Mum had been thoroughly put off by boats by my dad early on in their marriage due to what she called his gung-ho attitude. I, though, loved the gung-ho bits and craved for the weather to be bad and the waves to be big. I had a real goal one day to own my own speedboat, 
to be able to drive around in it and to tinker with the engine. Obviously, a real speedboat was out of the question, but instead I got to build one with my dad, a very cool little eight-foot wooden rowing boat with a 1.5 HP engine on the back. The boat is barely fast enough to make any progress against the oncoming tides, but it was perfect for me. We rigged up an improvised cable system, linked to a steering wheel bolted to the bench, and I was away. I would head off to meet my mum and dad um, at a small bay a few miles from the coast. I would go by sea, they would walk. I just loved the freedom that I found being in charge of a boat on the sea. I was always pushing dad to allow me to take Lara's second-hand laser sailing boat out on my own. This was a single-handed racing dinghy, super prone to capsizing and requiring substantially more weight than my puny 11-year-old frame could offer. I just thrived off the challenge, the solitude, the big waves and spray. I loved the time alone, just nature and me, but only as long as I had that safety net of knowing that dad was nearby on hand to help in a crisis, which was often the case. And I felt on top of the world as I sailed back onto the harbour, drenched like a drowned rat, grinning from ear to ear, hands and muscles burning from holding the line so tightly against the same strong wind that had driven all the other boats back to port. It was a feeling that I could be a little different from everyone else of my age, and that if pushed, I could battle against the forces of nature and prevail. Adventure felt the most natural thing in the world, and it was where I came alive. It is what made me feel, for the first time, really myself. As I got older and the rest of the world got more complicated and unnatural, I sought more and more the identity and wholeness that adventure gave me. In short, when I was wet, muddy and cold, I felt a million dollars, and when I was with the lads, with everyone desperately trying to be cool, I felt more awkward and unsure of myself. I could do mud, but trying to be cool was never a success. So I learnt to love the former and shy away from the latter. Although I gave cool a brief good go as a young man, a young teenager, buying wrinkle picker boots and listening to heavy metal records all through one long winter, both of which were wholly unsatisfying and subsequently dropped as boring. Instead, I would often dress up in my worst, aka my best and dirtiest clothes, stand under the hosepipe in the garden, get soaking wet in December and then go off for a run on my own in the hills. The locals thought me a bit bonkers, but my dog loved it and I loved it. It felt wild and it was a feeling that captured me more and more. Once I returned from one such run, caked in mud and ran past a girl I quite fancied. I wondered if she might like the muddy look. It was at least original, I thought. Instead, she crossed the road very quickly, looking at me as if I was just weird. It took me a while to begin to learn that girls don't always like people who are totally scruffy and covered in mud. And what I considered natural, raw and wild didn't necessarily equal sexy. Lesson still in progress. Chapter 13. On one occasion, probably aged about 11, I remember being dared by a local friend of mine from the Isle of Wight to attempt with him a crossing of the harbour at low tide. I knew the reputation of the harbour and I felt in my bones that it was a bad idea to attempt the beat, to beat the mud and sludge, but it also sounded quite fun. Now, to cross the harbour at low tide, it would be no mean feat, as the mud was the worst, thick, deep, oozy, limb-sucking variety, and in short, it was a damn stupid plan flawed from the start. Within 10 yards of the shore, I knew it was a bad idea, but foolishly, I just kept going. Sure enough, by the time we were about a third of the way out, we were stuck, and I mean really stuck. I was up to my chest in black, stinking clay, slime and mud. We had used up so much energy in the short distance we had travelled that we were soon utterly beat, utterly stationary and in utterly big trouble. Each time we tried to move, we got dragged down further, and I felt that awful sense of panic you get when you realise that you are into something beyond your control. By the grace of God, two things happened. First of all, I found out by experiment that if I tried to swim on the surface of this mud and not to fight it, then I could make very slow progress. Well, at least progress of sorts. So slowly, we both turned around and literally clawed our way back to the shore, inch by inch. The second thing that happened was someone on the shore spotted us and called the lifeboat. Now I knew we were in trouble, whether we made it out or not. By the time the lifeboat had arrived on scene, we had made it ashore, both looking like monsters from the deep, and we had scapered. My mother inevitably heard about what had happened, as well as the part about the lifeboat being launched to rescue us. I was made, rightly, to go round to the coxswain of the lifeboat's house and apologise in person, as well as offer to do chores for the crew in penance. It was a good lesson. Know your limits, don't embark on any adventures without a solid backup plan, and don't be egged on by others when your instincts tell you something is a bad idea. Apart from your disaster, I found that as I grew up, I gravitated more and more to the outdoors. Because my mother never really enjoyed Dad and me going off on joint missions, as I got older, the occasions of adventure, adventuring together with Dad, sadly decreased. As an aside, the one occasion in later life that I did get 
him out in the biggest mountains with me with a year or so after I passed SAS selection. I suggested we take a hike into Brecon Beacons to climb some of the peaks in South Wales, which had been the focal point of so many military marches and tests. I arranged for Dad to meet at the Merthyr Tildall station at Sergeant Taff, my troop sergeant. How will I recognise Taff, Dad asked. You'll recognise him, I replied. Taff looked military through and through, short, stocky, tight head, and with a classic soldier's handlebar moustache. Taff collected Dad and we all met up on the Brecon Beacons. The mountains were shrouded in howling gale. We got halfway up the first peak, yet after an exciting river crossing of a raging torrent that was normally only ever a trickle of stream, I noticed Dad's nose was bleeding badly. He looked very pale and tired, so we headed down. We had a fun few days together like this in the mountains, but by the time he got home to my mother, he accused me of half killing him. She accused me of half killing him and told us that there would be strictly no more death expeditions. I understood where she was coming from, but she kind of threw the baby out of the bathwater and her blanket ban on our trips simply meant dad and I missed out on a load of fun adventures that I know he was keen to do. Now that dad is no longer with us, I feel sad. We didn't exploit these precious years together, but that is life sometimes. The final real adventure I had with dad growing up was also my first taste of being in a life-threatening, genuine survival situation. And despite the danger, I found that I loved it. The final mission also probably had something to do with my mother's ban on dad and me undertaking further escapes into the world. Yet like all great adventures, it started off so innocently.